Okay, David Moffat on the Moffcast, uh, my <laughs> new attempt at podcasting. But I've got a fantastic guest on uh, today to have a bit of a chat about his uh, his life and where he is now and where he's going in the future. But before that, I'm going to actually embarrass him because I know the sort of character that uh, Wayne Smith is. Uh, he's very modest um, and um, he may not like me doing this, but I'm going to do it anyway. He's, one of, he's regarded as one of the best uh, rugby coaches of all time. And, and I agree with that. Um, he's a tactical genius. He's had two titles with the Crusaders, two titles with the Chiefs, two Rugby World Cup wins with the All Blacks. Uh, and his record with the All Blacks is that he was um, involved with them for 212 games, 184 wins, 21 losses, and seven draws. I mean, that, that is a phenomenal record, Smithy. And, uh, you know, I hope you don't mind me bringing up. And, of course, uh, I'll let you tell the viewers and listeners um, you also had a bit of success up in Japan. And uh, you may like to just uh, tell us a little bit about the photograph in the background. Yes, yeah, so um, that's right. Hi, hi Moff. Great, great to join you again. It's been, been a few years. Yeah. Um, yeah, the photo behind me is Kabelko Steelers, 94-year-old um, rugby club in Japan. And uh, I started with them when I finished with the All Blacks in 2017. I became director of rugby um, for them. Initially, it was going to be an eight-week contract, but um, I was there about 23 weeks the first year and really, really enjoyed it. Um, and the photo is simply about creating an identity, um, knowing who we are, where, where we came from, and um, who we were honouring. So um, I, lo I love the photo. Kept it there. Absolutely. Um, but... Uh... You know, you, you did have some success up in, in Japan with, uh, you know, Kobe Steel. Yeah, um, we did. I, I was contracted really to try and change the game. They played a very kick-orientated game, driving malls, playing for penalties, kicking to touch, and they wanted to expand the game. So that, that was my brief. Um, and I had some pretty good players off up there. So I had um, Daniel Carter, Adam Ashley <laughs> Cooper, Adam Ashley Cooper would probably be, I think Graham Henry and I would say he's probably the best player we coached against because he was so versatile and he always yeah. played well against the All Blacks. Had him in the team, Andy Ellis, who was a, a brilliant leader. Um, so I had really good players. Um, we developed this really exciting game. Had good coaches. I was able to recruit the coaches who are now who are now have taken over and are coaching the team. Um, and we played Suntory, Eddie Jones's team in the in our first final up in Tokyo and at their club ground or their stadium. And we beat them 55-5. And um, it was just a really special day, you know, real great run in rugby. And Daniel Carter got player of the match and player of the season and all the awards. But it was a real, real team effort. Yeah. And we won the following and we won the following year as well. So we had a couple of really great years there. Just a phenomenal record, Smithy, right, right around the world. Now, I'm going to ask you a difficult question here because, as you would know, you're an avid follower of everything rugby. Wales is currently in a bit of trouble, right? And, and obviously, Wayne Pivak is a Kiwi. You know him well. Yep. Would you ever consider going up there on a consultancy basis to help them out? Because... I've been uh, been creating a bit of a Twitter storm, <laughs> as you know I can do from time to time, um, <laughs> uh, and and uh, they need some help, mate. And I, you know, and I, and I mentioned that I was having you on my podcast today, and I said I'd, I would ask you the question. <laughs> um, yeah, it's 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 an interesting um, question, Moff, because I have had um, approaches previously to go and help teams up there or, or to actually be the head coach of teams up there. I've always been pretty close, but something that really stuck out to me, um, Roy Keane came in to spend some time with the All Blacks. He was doing a, it was part of his coaching certification for, for football. And we were in Wellington one night and um, we asked him to get up and talk to the boys. And he said something really interesting. He, um, at the end of his, or towards the end of his career, 
he felt um, that Sir Alex Ferguson wasn't paying him enough and <laughs> essentially decided to go to Celtic to, to give um, two fingers to, to Alex Ferguson. <laughs> and so he did that and he said as soon as he pulled the, the jersey on, he realised it was the wrong jersey. All right. It wasn't wasn't yeah. the jersey he'd grown up loving and, and the jersey he loved. So, and that always made a real impression on me. And so, essentially, I decided I'd, I'd pulled on the All Black jersey and I'd coached him for so long that it wasn't going to be the right thing to do for me to 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 go to another another country. Year. Yeah, uh, that, that's not set in stone. Um, but I have got a project this year that is going to take up a fair bit of time. So um, it won't be on the cards. Uh, right. Okay. Well, as you've you've said, never say never. Um, yeah. And um, they could certainly do with your expertise up there. Talking about the All Blacks, and I know that you've had a few things to say in recent times. Where do you see them at the moment, following the Northern Hemisphere tour and leading into twenty twenty three? Well, I th uh, there's been a um, a series of factors, I think, in in that the Northern Hemisphere, I think, has really made some huge gains in terms of coach education. Um, that's had a huge effect on their game. Um, they've developed a much higher skill level with their with their tight forwards up there. They're able to play. Um, a lot of them are playing a way more expansive game than what they've done before. And we and Australia um, effectively were, were stuck in um in a bubble down here governed by covid um playing each other um often quite often those games weren't even that competitive and so i think there's been a a shift in um in global rugby and we can no longer say that would characterize northern hemisphere as a driving kicking um doer um rugby experience they're playing a much more expensive game. They're playing it well um, with high skill level from, from front rowers, for example, and much more movement. So I think there's been a, yeah, an evening out of the, of the game. And to me, that the most important thing now for us down here is to, is to get in the crow's nest, look at the horizon, um, see how the wind shifted and... All Blacks have always been great at reinventing themselves, and I think there's a bit of that needs to go on at the moment where um, we're going to have to find a way to combat that those strengths of the Northern Hemisphere teams and, and, and grab back that um, advantage that we had somehow. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I've always said is that, you know, there's a fear factor when teams play the All Blacks. Uh, and, and I just wonder whether that's still there to the extent that it has been in the past, Smithy. Yeah, but probably not. I, I think there are advantages in the past in that um, there wasn't much media. Um, no. There's very little vision. Um, there wasn't social media. Um, y you know, every part of teams that you coach these days um, somehow um, podcasts or media or whatever, um, they can piece together what you're actually doing in the team. There's very little secrecy these days. In the past, there's an aura around the All Blacks. You now, what are they doing? Um, how are they how are they playing this game? Um, there, there's very little information um, eked out of the environment. But now, you've got um, NFL coaches holding up legacy. You know, before a before a Super Bowl final, saying. Um, we based a lot of our stuff on on the All Blacks, you know, who play rugby yeah. union, and yeah, yeah. Um, so 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 there's way more information. Um, I remember when I was at Chiefs with Dave Rennie, and we created our own language around the game based on the settlement of our of our region by Tainui. Um, I even called the defence Tainui because not only were they the people who settled the region, but Nui means extraordinary, and Tainui also means a, a river and flood, like the Waikato River and, fl and flood, and that's defence to me, you know. And so yeah. <laughs> we had all this sort of stuff within the team, and then um, a very smart bloke from Massey University um, did a PhD thesis in 
and applying Maori culture to sport at the Chiefs. And I contacted him to see how he got all this information. I had everything. And he'd got it all from YouTube, social media. Anytime someone did a, an interview in front of our um, posters or in front of um, our artwork on the wall, um, it gave away secrets. And he was smart enough to be able to interpret those and then um, wrote this amazing dissertation. <laughs> but I think, I think from what I hear from other other coaches and people like that is that one of the things they say about you is that you're incredibly open uh, and and very frank with them. You don't give them you don't give away the trade secrets, you know, the deep trade secrets of the All Blacks. But you're certainly the sort of person who's happy to share your experiences and your views about rugby. And and I think that's fantastic because all too often you know, coaches are like mother hens, you know, they just keep all their eggs underneath them and, you know, they keep everybody out. But that doesn't seem to be your style. Well, I, I learned a really valuable lesson in 97. So um, when I first came into the Crusaders, the um, union in those days, as you know, Moff, um, they ran a, a super rugby conference at the start of every season I went up to the conference I was really excited new coach taking over the team the keynote speaker was um, Graham Henry who had coached the champion blues team in 96 and we're probably going to win it again in 97 and so he gave this presentation and I was writing down everything because he was giving all his secrets away yeah. you know to the extent of how he set this set the scrum platform the eight nine pass had to be eight meters wide and flat and he gave all the stuff away and so I'm writing everything down. I looked at Ross Cooper and, and Frank Oliver and they were writing everything down as well. And I thought, this is outstanding. So I went back to Chiefs, uh, back to Crusaders and um, started implementing some of the stuff that Graham had said and melded it into my own ideas. Um, and then I realized watching, watching the Blues play that he'd only given us a certain amount of stuff and we were all trying to get to, to there <laughs> and he was already he'd already gone to there, so um, so there's a bit of method in the madness. Um, I'm I'm happy to share ideas, um, but I normally share past ideas, and yeah. um, and there, there is a certain amount of stuff within a team that you have to have to keep um, to yourselves. You know, you um, the only stewards of the jersey for a short time, and you've got to make it count. But I'm always happy to share stuff afterwards. <laughs> Smithy, um, looking ahead to 2023, um, who do you see as the biggest threats? Um, well, I, I think the All Blacks will be um, will be really difficult to beat, personally, because I know the history, um, and of course, society's changed, and you know the the All Blacks pretty much based everything on number eight wire on. Um, looking at the laws, trying to find ways around them, been really innovative. Even back in 1905, you know, on the boat over, Dave Gallagher read the law book and decided that there was nothing stopping them having one player of the 15 be a forward sometimes and a back at other times. And so he invented the wing forward position we played in. And um, ironically, though, they lost the last game against Wales in that tour because they failed to reinvent themselves <laughs> <laughs> because Wales played the tactic back at them. But regardless, um, New Zealand being famous, All Blacks being famous for really advancing quickly when there have been law changes, which are going to come again shortly, I would imagine, due to safety. The law changes and any differences in styles in the game, they've been quick at doing that. And, and I think that'll happen again. Now, one thing about Ian Foster is that he, he's a hard worker, he's, he's analytical, he's um, very good at looking at stuff on the computer, and he's got really sound um, sound understanding of the game, particularly attack. So, you know, I've I got a feeling that they will harbour a lot of the criticism that's, that's going on at the moment, and they'll use it to um, really inspire themselves because yeah. it's the way they've always been. So I think... I think they'll be in the conversation. Australia will be interesting. I think with Dave Rennie, he's a man I've got a lot of time for, obviously. And um, we're pretty close. Um, he will he will create something pretty special, I think, going into 223. 
So I wouldn't underestimate them. And then um, Springboks, clearly, um, are going to have a lot of the a lot of the players that um, won in two nineteen, particularly up front. Uh, they don't play much. They only play forty minutes each <laughs> because it, because the bomb squad comes on and yes. does the job. So, so I think they'll be. So I think the Southern Hemisphere will still be dangerous. Um, and then you've got probably the top two teams in the world today. The way they're playing would be France and Ireland for me. Yeah, um, that they're innovative. It's great to see France playing some innovative footy, moving the ball, keeping the ball alive in the contact. And Ireland the same. And the the attack coach at Ireland, um, Mike Cat, is pretty outstanding. I think he, you know, he's he's back in the he's in the background a wee bit, but he's done an amazing job with his skill level, and they play a great game. So, I think those five teams, and then you, you can't rule out England, of course, can you? And um, um, well, having been born in Yorkshire, uh, um, uh, and I have a British passport, I can <clears throat> I can rule out England myself. <laughs> I, I was just yeah, going I, to say, I don't think so. No, 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 I'm just joking. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, look, I think the thing that... I was just going to say, Moff, um, yeah. sorry, I was just going to say, hey. the, interesting, the interesting teams for me at the World Cup now are going to be Tonga and, particularly Tonga and Samoa. Tonga. So if you look at the Tongan backline, could well be Augustine Pulu at halfback, Charles Pietau at 10, um, Fekitoa and George Moala in the midfield. Um, Israel um, fill out fullback and a myriad of wingers that you could, you know, you go all around the world, you're going to find Tonga wingers. Yeah. Uh, they're going to be exceptional. I don't think you can rule out teams like them and some are making a bit of a splash. Uh, you know, and, and I think, I think you're a hundred percent correct. Not that I thought too much about it, but I certainly take on board what, what you're saying. One of the things that I've liked in the last, I suppose, few months is that we're getting away from what I call McDonald's rugby, right? Now, if you have, a, if you have McDonald's anywhere in the world, other than Russia, because you can't get McDonald's there anymore, but it all tastes the same, looks the same, you know, comes out the same, yeah. right? And I think that's what our rugby's been. It's been bash and kick, you know, and, and that's been boring the hell out of everybody including, I suppose, well, I don't know about the players, but, you know, the, I think they like to run with the ball. Um, but it's good to see that the French are playing like the French. You know, um, Ireland is playing a more expansive game. The All Blacks will always play an expansive game. Australia needs to get back to running rugby. Uh, and, you know, and, and so every, every team used to have their own little style of playing, and I think we're getting back to that. And I think that can only be really good for the game. I think I'd put Japan into the mix. I mean, you know, you, you know a lot about Japanese rugby and I've been working with a fair bit with Robbie on the 11s concept, which I haven't yet shared with you, but I will, but um, not on here, <laughs> but, but, it, <laughs> but, and it's, and it's, there's nothing in it for me. You know, it is just purely uh, addressing the issues of safety and simplicity, but um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's good to see that. That's what I and the Welsh, for example, you know, you know, because you, you you were brought up in that era of the great Welsh players and the you know how yeah. how how they played the game. They were nimble. They were wily. You know, they were. I'd love to see them get back to that because that's and they have still got those players, but they get quickly coached out of it. Yeah, I think oh, you're spot on. Um, there's been an era of coaches probably following the herd too much. Um, when, when, when I started coaching, um, you know, I started in 1986 as a player coach in Italy. And of course the game was amateur. Um, there was no future in coaching other than as a passion. And so there was no requirement to follow what everyone else did. And so we all developed different characteristics. Um, when I came back to New Zealand and, and, and when I started coaching Canterbury B and then, as I say, the Crusaders in, from 97, um, people thought I was mad. But the, the, I think the rugby public in Canterbury thought I was weird, which is good. I, I quite like that. But I, <laughs> I never, you know, I wasn't Griswoli and um, it wasn't my way of doing it. And I developed 
my own way of asking questions and trying to create self-awareness through that and a game-based learning um, methodology. And it just, yeah, it took a long time for it to be accepted. Um, but I didn't care. I thought I'd just go back teaching probably. Um, so I never imagined that the, that I would be where I, you know, where I am today. Yeah. And 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 I think through that period, the newer coaches coming in have essentially all. They, there's been a bit of innovation, but generally they they all do the same thing. And um, and part of it would be, you know, you you get your review at the end of year and you go in front of the board and if you can say, well, I followed best practice. You know, I, we, we didn't win, but we're following best practice and we're, um, you know, we're, we're doing as well as other teams. Uh, I think that's been part of it. Today, yeah, there's, there's a movement back, as you say, to um, more expansive game. Uh, I'm not sure what the catalyst is for that, but certainly the French have been have been needing to do that for years. And finally, they got Gaultier, who's a bit different, I think. Looks different. Um, he's got a different attitude. Uh, just the fact that he's taken someone like Sean Edwards on, which the French probably would never have done in the past, take, taken an outside influence, shows that he does think differently. So, you know, he's creating his own thing. And then you've got an ex-rugby league superstar and Farrell taking Ireland. So he probably thinks differently too. And he's got an Englishman, Mike Cat, run, running the attack. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, th I, th I think the game's changing because the people are, are changing. They, they come to realise that we've got to create our own flavour, not, not what everyone else has got. Yeah, and and I think that you know that that's fantastic. And uh, uh, my interest is most likely increased a little bit. You know, having been sort of a little bit blasé about, uh, you know, I don't want to go and watch everybody playing the same way. Um, yeah. But it's great to see that that sort of um, thing. So what? So um, so what? Ho you say you're sort of retired-ish, um, <laughs> but. Uh, can't ever imagine that you're ever going to retire, Smithy, even though you're living in a beautiful part of New Zealand. Um, I, uh, yeah, what, 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 what's the future hold? Um, well, several things. I, I'm, I've got a, a number of players that I mentor and I really enjoy that. Um, takes, yeah, it takes a, a bit of time to watch the games, make some notes, cut some clips. Um, but it's a hugely rewarding job, um, not a job, <laughs> no <laughs> um, interest. Um, I'm in a foundation with a guy called David Galbraith, who's one of our top sports sites, um, and some other friends, Crystal Kawa, who's probably a top women's coach um, in New Zealand, uh, people like that. And we created a mentoring foundation, really, where the idea is sort of like pyramid selling, where we all mentor a number of people and then we get them to mentor people and so oh, you're creating yeah. a yeah, yeah. creating a sort of a, a network so I'm, I'm involved in that um i still help um Kibaka Steelers coaches as a as a coach advisor on zoom hey oh man i've got a big zoom um number of hours per year that's for sure under covid yeah <laughs> um i do that i've uh graham henry and i are, are partners with a with a couple of other mates in a little company in Tonga trying to provide um, cheaper building materials oh, for the Tongan people which is which is pretty appropriate at the moment it's yeah. hard getting the it's hard getting the building materials um, but you know cutting the cost I think it's important and, that, and essentially Graham and I decided to do it because of what the Tongan players have done for our careers you know yeah. Yeah. we wouldn't be anywhere without what players do for you you know you're only a coach you're not actually out there playing so yeah, I've got an interest in that. I'd like to get back over to Tonga as soon as we can. And we've got support from rugby um, to take gear over there. Like the Chiefs gave us about 100 jerseys to take over. And oh, right. Auckland, Rug Auckland Rugby have given us rugby balls, about 80 rugby balls, I think, to take to school. So um, that, that's going to be an interest in the future. And, you know, I'm, I've been a lifelong player and coach you know my whole life has been involved in the game since I was a kid of about five in Patararu so um yeah I'm always interested in, in doing different jobs and getting involved um and, and maybe maybe I will go 
to another team at some stage. Who knows? Well, um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to take your sort of soft no in respect of the Wales on board um, because you know I mean uh, I do do get involved in in trying to sort of fix Welsh rugby because. I, right from when I was young, I loved the Welsh and the way they played. And then when I was up there running Welsh rugby, I get a lot of stick from, you know, especially from Ponty Priest supporters. But I think with um, Steve Hansen was exceptionally helpful to me when I got there um, in, in, right. actually, in actually getting down to the four teams that needed. I mean, and you would be, yeah. you'd, you'd understand why that had to happen. But, but, you know, the Welsh seem to think that they've got a mortgage on parochialism and, and they don't understand how parochial New Zealand is. But New Zealanders can look past that and see the bigger picture. Um, so, you know, it, and I love my time there and, you know, they're, they're now much more competitive, although this year they weren't. But, you know, they're much more competitive than they were with only four professional teams. Um, so, you know, I, I always have a, a, a real desire to see them do well what's happened there. And it's happening here because I think you may have alluded to it, something I read recently, I think, is that the professional game has pretty much left the the uh, community amateur game behind, you know, and, and that needs to be addressed and, uh, you know, I, I know that the plans in New Zealand rugby are to do that, but they're going to have to put it into uh, into place pretty quickly because my understanding is that basketball is going to soon surpass rugby as a participation sport here in New Zealand. Yes. Um, actually, I remember that era of yours really well at Wales because I was coaching Northampton at the time and um, I, we were playing Cardiff at, uh, in the Europe in the Heineken Cup at um, Card what was Carter Farms um, basically yeah. the yeah. ground and uh, after the game Steve came into the changing rooms and he was telling me about the you know the the, the flack he was getting for trying to revolutionise the game and and create the, the Super Rugby type teams and yeah. which is which has been a success huge success. Um, but how tough it was in those days yeah. for you and him to to battle that parochialism that existed, you know. And um, uh, yeah, they they were they were interesting days. But um, I can understand your desire to to really help the Welsh. It's a great it's a great great rugby country, and um, with great players coming through constantly. Well, actually, one of the um, one of the best days of my life was being at um, the, the Cardiff club rooms there with Sir Brian Hoare after a, after an international game there and getting all these signatures on a, on a piece of card that I, that I picked up of Barry John and Gareth Edwards was there and um, uh, Jackie Matthews yeah. was there, you know, and Bledon Williams and those guys. So I was able to get all these, um, signatures and then take them home to dad and put them in a wee frame. Uh, One of mate, the best days of my life. That's, br you know, that, that, that's brilliant, um, uh, you know, to, he to hear you say that because I think that gives us a, a real insight into the character of Wayne Smith, you know. You, you know, you're, you're a humble uh, guy who um, just does all of his speaking with his actions. And um, I'm a great fan, mate, and... Uh, you know, I I, um, I I miss the hustle and bustle of being involved in in rugby, but then, you know, I had my time and I and I did a, a lot of things that I really liked. And one of the proudest things I have, actually, we've moved not so long ago, and I haven't got them up, but I've got two blazers. You know, the blazer brigade. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I've got two. One's New Zealand rugby, and the other is Welsh rugby. As yeah. chief executive of both of those organisations. And I'm not sure anybody will ever do that again. You know, I mean, you've had you've had uh, Hanson and Henry coach Wales and the All Blacks, um, but I'm not sure an, an administrator will do both those jobs no. again. And and it's a matter of 
I know my dad who passed away some years ago was very proud of that, that particular fact. And yeah, I remember you coming in as a really successful businessman too, and, and sort of in that era where the game was becoming commercialized and I think it was important for New Zealand rugby and, and for Welsh rugby. And you're right, those are two unique blazers and two of the great rugby, oh. um, has, historically, two of the greatest rugby nations in the world. Uh, absolutely. Smithy, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Um, it's been everything and more that I would expect it to be. Your knowledge of the game and the players and the coaches playing the game today is not astounding because I just expect that that's what you do. But, but anybody who watches this will get a real feeling for what makes you tick and why you've been so successful. But it's been a privilege for me to have you on my podcast. And, um, I, you know, I would I'd like to thank you very much. Thanks, Moff. Yeah, um, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I just don't want to play spoofing with you anymore because I remember losing, <laughs> losing, losing that guy. Losing that in the back of the bus. And, uh, <laughs> no, the, the one at dinner in um, Canada. Oh, and no, we were yes. playing for who was going to pay yeah. for the dinner and I got last. <laughs> I got last, and, but, but you you um, very kindly paid the dinner for me, so I appreciated that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, mate. Excellent yeah. stuff. Okay. Thanks very much, Dave.